I want to sort of change pace a little bit from uh, the talks this morning and try to, to give sort of an overview of some of the considerations we need to have when we're simulating different types of systems. Today I'm going to talk about binary star systems in particular and I'm going to focus on formation since this is a star and planet formation uh, summer school. Um, but I'm not going to talk about code details. I'm going to assume that uh, Tom and Patrick have covered that already earlier this week. And instead I'm going to assume you have sort of the general flavor of what, what these different codes are about. And we can talk about some of their advantages and shortcomings as we consider different problems. So please feel free to stop me um, as we go. And although I'm not timing myself, I'm not holding my own timer, I will try very hard to finish uh, at 12.30, even though we're starting a little late. So I may skip a few things. So just a quick outline, uh, the things I want to talk about is first, why should we bother thinking about binaries if we're talking about star and planet formation? I'm going to very briefly uh, describe some of the ways we think that they form, but that's not going to be the focus. What I really want to think about uh, and have you consider is what are the specific challenges that binary star systems present to us as simulators? And I'll show some example calculations. So why bother with binaries? So some of you have probably seen this slide before, but I just want to really emphasize that binaries are really fundamental to so many branches of astrophysics. Even if you don't just want to think about star formation, binaries should matter to you. They matter if you want to understand general relativity. Recall that one of the greatest confirmations of uh, general relativity was the indirect detection of gravitational waves um, due to the decay of the orbit of the Hulse-Taylor binary. Uh, of course, binaries are likely to also provide the first direct detection of gravitational waves. Uh, binaries make supernova, so either if you like explosions or you care about cosmology, uh, binaries should matter to you. If you like black holes, the way that we confirm the existence of stellar mass black holes is when they are found in binary star systems. Uh, for the planet people in the audience, uh, exoplanet characterization relies firmly on everything we've learned from spectroscopic eclipsing binaries. The only way that we know the relationship between the mass of the star, its radius, its temperature, its luminosity, its spectra, is when we find them in these very special binary systems. And by applying those same parameters to exoplanetary systems, we can learn something about the planets. Um, since Charlie is in the audience, I'll just point out that uh, binaries may also be important for the reionization of the universe. And so if you're interested in that, uh, you should talk to Charlie uh, maybe later on today. So I'm going to move on to just give you a brief overview of what we think we know about binary formation. So if they're very fundamental to all of astrophysics, we should probably know where they come from. So. Um, here's what I think we as theorists know, and I've placed no in quotation marks because as you'll see, the field of binary formation is still in some ways very young, despite the fact that we've been studying it for quite some time. So one of the things we know about binaries is they help solve a long-standing problem in star formation known as the angular momentum problem. When we look at giant molecular clouds and the cores that are the progenitors of stars, we find that they have a lot of angular momentum compared to how much angular momentum is in a single star left at the end. And one of the ways that we can sort of use up some of this excess angular momentum is if they are placed into binary systems because if you put two masses far away and have them orbit one another, that takes up a lot of the angular momentum. One thing we also know is that there are probably multiple pathways to formation. If we look at binary star systems, they cover a broad range of parameters in terms of the mass ratios. We have equal mass binaries. We have 1 to 100, nearly, mass ratio binaries. Um, they, span a, they span a very broad range in terms of their orbital periods. There are five-day orbital periods, and there are 5,000 AU orbital periods. So there's, uh, there's, there's quite a range, and so it would be it would be surprising if there was really only one way to make all of those different types of binaries. Another thing that we know as theorists, and, and I'll point out later we also observe this, is that the population of binaries in young star forming regions and clusters should be distinct from the population in the field. And that's because there is dynamical processing in between these two populations. And finally, something else that we know is that the formation mechanism should leave an imprint 
on the population. We should be able to look at the population and infer something about how the stars formed. But because of that previous point, because of this idea of dynamical processing, this can actually be a real challenge and, and again, something we're, we're actively working on. So I'd say there's sort of three modes of binary formation that we think operate in different uh, regimes of parameter space. Um, the sort of simplest to understand is the idea of capture or ejection, meaning that you either start with two unaffiliated stars, they somehow have a close encounter that is somewhat dissipative, and you end up taking an unbound system and making it bound. Um, as shown here, one of the uh, better ways to capture a system is if you actually have an interaction between a protostellar disk around one star and another star, although even this process is not effective in most uh, regimes of parameter space. You need very, very high stellar densities. Physically, it can certainly happen. It's just probably not the dominant mechanism. We think probably the two dominant e mechanisms are these two modes of fragmentation, which I'm calling turbulent fragmentation and disk fragmentation. And another way you could say this is large-scale fragmentation or small-scale fragmentation. Either as you're just starting to form your stellar system out of a relatively dense uh, protostellar core, maybe because of that excess angular momentum, because of some turbulent perturbations in those clouds, you end up with two density peaks rather than just one, and those two density peaks can be bound together, and their orbital periods will evolve as the cluster forms. Um, if you're a little bit more patient, you can form a, a binary on a smaller scale too, and this is something I'm not going to talk about too much because I know Tom is going to speak about disk fragmentation tomorrow. So he will talk about the details of this process, but um, many people think of this or have heard about it first in the context of planet formation. Um, but in fact, it is a probably for at least for more massive stars one of the best ways to make um, binaries rather than planets. So that's almost all I'm going to say about binary formation for now, and I'll just quickly give you a little taste of what we actually have observed about binary star systems so you, so you sort of know where we're coming from and what we're, what we're working up against as theorists. So uh, we have a pretty good idea of what the distribution of binaries looks like for solar type stars. It's a log flat distribution in terms of numbers from about 5 to 3,000 AU. So this is again what I'm trying to emphasize. The distribution of parameters of binaries is incredibly broad. And although I have argued that due to that breadth, you might expect there to be different mechanisms, we don't see any breaks in the distribution. We don't see a peak at some, at some range of radii and then another peak at some other range of radii, which you might expect if you had two different mechanisms contributing. And, and we don't really know why we don't see a break. Um, there are uh, some distinctions uh, in the separation distribution as a function of mass. Lower mass stars tend to have slightly uh, smaller separations. Um, higher mass stars are a little bit more tricky in the sense that it's uh, a greater observational hurdle to observe both enough of them because they're typically further away and they're, because they're rare and to observe sort of a broad range of the parameter space because if you take an O star and you put a G star next to it, it's very, very hard to see. So we can't see very unequal mass binaries around O stars. Um, which can bias our understanding of the mass ratio and separation distribution. Um, one thing to keep in mind um, for this is this is going to be very important for understanding binary formation in general is that for solar type stars, all companion masses are equally probable. So that does not mean that the two stars are randomly drawn from the IMF. If I start with one star and I randomly draw from the IMF, what is my other star going to be? <sighs> No, if I random, if I take, if I start with any star and I, then I randomly draw from the IMF, what is the next star going to be? An M-dwarf. It's an M-dwarf, right? Because all stars to zeroth order are M-dwarfs. So if, uh, if, t if binaries were randomly drawn from the IMF, every star would have an M-dwarf as a companion. That is not the case. So again, that tells us something that when we're talking about forming binaries, uh, it is not just combining together what we think of as the single star formation process. Uh, just to show you uh, what I've said in a few plots. So first, uh, this is one of my favorite plots um, about binaries. So this is spectral type on the x-axis, fraction of stars with, uh, with companions on the y-axis. Uh, error bars are large, but we can all agree this is not a straight line. So the companion frequency depends strongly on spectral type. So again, when we're starting to think about simulating star formation, 
we should pay attention to what kind of stars we're thinking about. If you're trying to form M dwarfs, it's probably OK to think about single star formation at least some of the time. If you're trying to form solar type stars or more massive stars, you really shouldn't ever talk about single star formation because clearly most of the time they start in binaries. Building on that, we also know that if we look at pre-main sequence stars, they have a much higher multiplicity fraction than their counterparts in the field. And so you can see this is sort of, uh, there hasn't been a great recent paper on this. This is sort of the uh, gold standard, uh, Matthew 1994. So this is a distribution in period on the x-axis and the binary frequency on the y-axis. The main sequence is the uh, dashed line. And you can see the pre-main sequence is the solid line. So you can see there's a abundance of pre-main sequence binaries compared to main sequence binaries, which is, again, suggesting to us that binaries are really one of the dominant modes of star the star formation process as a whole. So coming back to theory a little bit, I just want to sort of give you a flavor of why this is still a really active field of research. So there are two different groups that have come up with reasonably good ways to reproduce some observational some observational features of the binary distribution. So one of them is Matthew Bate, and I'll show some of his work later, who's done some very high resolution uh, SPH simulations that include a lot of different physics, radiation. Uh, in some cases now he's put in MHD uh, cooling. And he can do a very good job of reproducing um, a lot of the features of the field binary population. But there's two caveats. He reproduces the field binary population at a very young stage for the cluster. And the initial conditions that he's chosen, I would say, are somewhat controversial in terms that not everybody would agree, particularly the observers, that they are a good representation of the precursor to star formation. On the other hand, we have models uh, like those of uh, Fisher 2004. And he has taken the opposite approach. He said, let me take what we think are the initial conditions that the observers give us in terms of what do these cores look like, how much angular momentum do they have, and then without worrying about the detailed physics, without worrying about radiation transport or magnetic fields or hydrodynamic turbulence or disk formation, any of that just says, if I apply some efficiency factors in terms of the mass division and the angular momentum division of these cores, what do I get out? And he also reproduces the field population of binaries this way. And so I just want this to be a sort of warning, both for the binary star problem and for any problem, is that just because you put in, either you put in a lot of physics or you start from the right initial conditions and you get out the right answer, doesn't mean you've solved the problem. So this is, this is something I think, especially as numericists, we have to be very cautious about, that we can, we can work really hard and put in a lot of resolution in physics, but it doesn't mean we're going to solve the problem. It's more complex than that. Uh, the initial conditions are much denser than the typical giant molecular cloud. And so the intercore and interstellar velocities are very high. And the way, one of the dominant ways that his simulations reproduce the mass ratio and separation distributions is based on sort of n-body interactions. And we, if you take sort of a more typical low mass star forming region, you wouldn't expect that level of interactions. So if we're trying to think about what are the problems we want to attack in binary star formation, um, you can divide them in sort of th to three different scales. So there's the large scale problems where you're worried about the formation of these binaries sort of from the collapse of the giant molecular cloud. This is sort of touching base with what uh, Mark was talking about, I think, yesterday. Um, now, if you want to go down further, you can think about what I call the mid-scale binaries, where you're saying, OK, I'm not going to worry about the background, the background giant molecular cloud. I just want to focus on one core. But even then, there's a lot of dynamic range between that core scale and where your stars are going to end up. Um, and that brings us to sort of the small scale problem, where you're worrying about not what's going on with the background core, but the interaction of those two young forming stars and, say, their protostellar disks. And this is sort of the fundamental problem with trying to understand binary formation is that there's a large range of scales we'd like to cover, 
And in any one uh, numerical simulation, this is a challenge. I'll just point out that there's sort of similar analogs to these problems uh, in the evolved binary community, both common envelope evolution and uh, supernova and tidal disruption problems, but I'm not going to focus on those today. So given the problems we have at hand, what do we want if we're trying to simulate a binary star system? You know, what, what are the particular requirements for these types of systems? So I'd say the most obvious one is that for any hydrodynamic problem, we want a robust hydrodynamic scheme. This is something that Patrick has spent a lot of time talking about. We want something that captures shocks very well. And in particular, we probably want something that has low numerical diffusion. So how much have you guys talked about numer numerical diffusion in the last couple of days? Some at all? I think Patrick has mentioned it a little bit. OK. Uh, so we know that in many of the codes that you're using, there is no explicit viscosity. But uh, as you saw with even the 1D you know, Riemann problems that you were looking at earlier this morning, uh, shocks diffuse in numerical simulations. They don't, they're not proper discontinuities. And if we want to understand um, a lot of processes in star formation, we need to do as, as best we can at reducing the numerical diffusion. This is a particular problem if you're thinking about uh, anything that involves an accretion disk, a protostellar disk. And I'll talk more about this tomorrow, and I think Tom may as well. Um, but remember that uh, accretion disks are, by definition, high Mach number flows. The Keplerian velocity in an accretion disk is large compared to the sound speed. And what that means is that in at least a standard grid code, you are advecting your flow rapidly across grid cells. And we know that the flux across a boundary is going to be essentially proportional to the errors that build up in our flux. And so this is going to be really important anytime we're simulating a disk. We have to keep in mind that a protostellar disk, by definition, is going, is going to be rapidly moving across our boundary. And this is something that um, various methods have tried to account for. So the other thing we need in binary problems, and this is not distinct from many other star formation problems, is we need dynamic range. We need it spatially, which we can get with AMR. And the other thing that we need is we need dynamic range in terms of mass. We need to be able to resolve both the stars and the background gas. And one of the common techniques to do this is sink particles, where we say, OK, we can't, we can't spatially resolve a star in our simulation, so I'm going to give up on spatial resolution and instead put in a point mass that interacts with the flow gravitationally, but doesn't properly interact with the flow hydrodynamically. And this is really one of the only ways computationally that we can simulate both a cloud and a star at the same time. Uh, we also, of course, want to include gravity in our calculations. In many cases, we want to include self-gravity. Um, and then this is, I think, the problem that makes binary formation particularly challenging numerically. And that is that we, don't, we can't enforce axis symmetry. So if you're simulating one star or a black hole in a galaxy, there's an obvious center of mass. And that means that you can choose a grid geometry that um, takes advantage of that. For example, a cylindrical grid. If you're simulating one star and a disk, there's an obvious axis of symmetry, and you can uh, set up your grid to take account for that. As soon as you add a binary, you've removed that axis of symmetry. You have two sort of dominant centers of mass. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that makes it a more challenging problem. Now, if you want to do the full problem, uh, just like any other aspect of star formation, you probably want to include MHD, you want to include radiation, maybe you want to include cooling and complex equations of state. So uh, it turns out to be a somewhat messy problem. So I just want to quickly go through and ask, you know, which, which code techniques are well suited to uh, simulating binary star systems. So I'll start out with the most simple, which I think is the one you've spent the most time on in the last couple of days, which is just a Cartesian grid code. Um, something like Ramsey's or Enzo. Um, and there's some distinct advantages for binary systems. Of course, as Patrick just talked about, you have adaptive mesh refinement is relatively easy to implement uh, in grid codes. Um, sync particles are often included. Uh, that's 
another thing that's been done by other people, so it's relatively straightforward. Uh, Self-gravity is particularly easier in uh, Cartesian grid codes than in many other geometries in the sense that you can uh, put in relatively efficient methods like FFTs. Um, uh, if you already are doing an AMR calculation, including multigrid gravity is often reasonably efficient. Um, the other thing that's been, I think, emphasized this week is that one great thing about a Cartesian grid code or any grid code is that you can use Riemann solvers, which are excellent at capturing shocks uh, and, and resolving the details of your hydrodynamic flows. Um, a lot of the other physics has already been put into these codes. And I might controversially say that the Cartesian geometry is somewhat flexible with respect to an axis of symmetry, by which I mean it's pretty much bad in any direction. But at least it's equally bad in any direction. Um, and so that actually is, is, is a pretty big advantage. Uh, for problems uh, in, involving binaries, I'd say one of the biggest issues is that when you uh, implement your equations in conservation form, you're conserving linear momentum rather than angular momentum. And if you're concerned about problems that have to do with disks or orbits, you're fundamentally more interested in angular momentum. And so that is something that you're always going to be struggling with. Again, you're going to face another uh, common problem in grid codes known as the high Mach number problem, which is where you're invecting your flow rapidly across your grid. And so again, that's going to naturally contribute to any errors in the calculation. So as, these, uh, as the flow is sort of orbiting about any center of mass, it's passing rapidly through grid cells at various angles. And so this is going to contribute to high uh, numerical diffusion. Uh, similarly, you're always stuck uh, if you're trying to simulate other stars or disks with resolving spheres with cubes. Um, so again, this is a problem of geometry. You might think if you were doing a, a single disk, right, you'd be better off if you had a cylindrical grid because then your flow would be aligned with your grid structure. And of course, as with any code, you do have dynamic range limitations. Um, even if you implement uh, an AMR type scheme, you're still left with current conditions or if you, in, if you uh, put in MHD, then you have to worry about the Alphane speed. And in Cartesian grid codes where you have to, um, where you have to put in boundary conditions, that don't, uh, don't affect in terms of density or temperature or the rest of your, your uh, calculation volume, that can often impose surprisingly strict conditions on your time stepping. So how am I doing on time? Um, I will just quickly mention, so some of these uh, images I'm showing are some from, from work that I've done on uh, disk fragmentation in the context of binary formation and um, what we've done here is taken advantage of AMR in exactly the way that Patrick was saying before by letting AMR move your boundary conditions far away from your calculation volume. So we set up a large marginally resolved uh, protostellar core and then in, the very, in a very small region in the center we actually resolve our disk and our fragmenting binary. And again, Tom is going to talk about the details of this process tomorrow. But this is just to show you we can do a reasonable job of resolving spherical structures and multiple centers of mass in a Cartesian grid code. Um, I'm just going to skip past this. Um, a second example of uh, binary problems you can solve with a grid code. This is uh, some <coughs> simulation work from uh, Bo Zhao, who's a graduate student with Jiun Li at the University of Virginia. And what he's been doing with ENZO, which is another publicly available uh, MHD AMR uh, grid code is trying to simulate the evolution of binary orbits under the influence of uh, magnetic breaking. Um, and these are just some uh, examples of the different uh, geometries he gets depending on the alignment of the magnetic field with the axis of rotation and showing how as a function of time it affects the separation of the binaries. Um, so again, I don't want to talk about the details of this, but just to give you a flavor of the types of calculations that are being done with grid codes. So one of the things we have been talking about is how there's this problem uh, with the geometry. So if you were simulating disks, again, you might think, well, what, what if I don't use a Cartesian grid? What if I use a cylindrical grid? Um, so that has some advantages. Uh, it means that your flows are aligned naturally with the geometry of the grid. So this can be very, very advantageous um, 
particularly if you implement schemes which take into account the fact that your, uh, you know that your gas is mostly in Keplerian rotation. You can still put in sink particles, self-gravity, the same uh, shock capturing hydro. Um, uh, the other big advantage is that you can actually explicitly conserve angular momentum as opposed to linear momentum, which is again very important for disk type calculations. And I'll just point out that one of the big advantages of these types of geometries is that you can implement this Fargo algorithm where you say, okay, I know my, my material is in a Keplerian orbit and therefore I can sort of take out the Keplerian motion when I'm solving my finite difference or Riemann problem across a grid face. I can say, I'm going to subtract the Keplerian velocity or boost into the frame of the Keplerian velocity calculate the relative flux after subtracting out the bulk of the velocity and then use that to update my grid. And what that does is substantially reduce the flux across any given grid boundary. And if you reduce the flux across your grid boundary, you reduce the truncation errors that build up as a result. It also buys you time in terms of your current condition because Right, we talked about how the current condition is it basically says you can't have communication that violates uh, the wave speed in your flow. Right, you don't want cells to communicate that should not be causally connected, and so you have to take sufficiently small time steps so that flows aren't advected from three cells away in a given time step. Well, if you are advecting your flow at the Keplerian velocity, you're sort of taking out the bulk of that. Uh, of that constraint on your current condition. So you're left with, you're able to take much larger relative time steps. Um, if you don't employ that scheme, you're of course still left with this high Mach number problem. As I said before, your axis of symmetry is very constrained. If you tried to put in, this was a sort of a planet migration simulation. If the mass of this secondary object becomes large compared to the central mass, you lose the, you lose the fact that your flow is in this nice uh, spherically symmetric geometry. And again, you're back to the problems of your Cartesian codes. And in fact, I'd say even worse, because now you have very different uh, numerical diffusion properties in one direction of your flow as compared to the other. So if you still want to do a binary star simulation with a spherical or a cylindrical geometry, uh, what people often do is they put a binary potential in the center of their domain. And it, it's live in the sense that it can interact uh, gravitationally with the actual hydrodynamic flow, but it is not uh, on the grid, so to speak. And so this is a real fundamental limitation to trying to do um, simulations with binaries in this geometry. So the next option, of course, is SPH. And for a lot of reasons, I think SPH is is very well suited to the specific problem of binary star formation. Um, most importantly, because it's Lagrangian. So you take care of your axis of symmetry and dynamic range problems in one go. Your resolution naturally follows the flow, and you don't have this problem of having to invect things rapidly across a grid. Sink particles are naturally incorporated into the, into the problem because they're just a special type of particle. They don't have to be imposed on top of it. So uh, that means that calculating gravity is sort of, uh, I don't want to say free, but it's already part of your calculation. Once you're walking a tree once, walking it a second time isn't so bad. So even if it's more of the expense, it's sort of naturally built into your calculation. You can explicitly conserve angular momentum, which is again very, very important for um, any calculation to having to do with orbits or disks. Uh, I'd say the biggest problems you run into, and if uh, Paul or Tom want to chime in, please feel free, is that there's very, uh, the, there, are, there are significant complexities in addressing numerical diffusion in SPH codes. So did you talk about how diffusion is implemented in SPH codes at all? Very quickly. Okay. I know about okay, so you know about alpha and beta? All right, so you, very okay, so, uh, I'll just very briefly say again that uh, in an SPH code, you have to choose how you uh, uh, add in an artificial viscosity, and it depends on the geometry of the flow, right? There's a component that depends on the shear, and there's a com the component that depends on the convergence or the divergence of the flow. So this means that your particles don't go inside one another. Um, 
But the, the challenge in that is that it's not as easy to uh, parameterize the contributions from your artificial, your numerical viscosity compared to any physical mechanism that you're simulating. Whereas in grid codes, you can, uh, in many cases, relatively easily measure your numerical diffusion or more importantly, solve the Navier-Stokes equation explicitly and put in a physical viscosity, which is in some cases less astrophysically motivated, but from a numericist perspective, at least we understand what we're putting into the code. Um, you still, of course, have dynamic range limitations, uh, challenges capturing shocks, and um, still some uncertainties in convergence for some problems. But nevertheless, I'm just going to take a break from talking and just show you a nice movie made with SPH. So this is uh, one of Matthew Bates' uh, recent cluster uh, and binary formation movies. And this just, I think, gives a nice sense of why SPH is so uh, nice to use for these types of problems because you're, you're Again, your particles naturally follow your flow, and you don't have to worry about boundary conditions in the same way. You don't have to fill some arbitrary computational volume with material that you're not interested in simulating. Every particle contributes to the problem that you're interested in simulating, whereas if I built a big grid that uh, occupied this entire volume, I would have to put something here. I couldn't have you know, relatively empty space here. Um, I'd have to put something there that didn't strongly affect my calculation. So I just want to spend a few minutes on a numerical technique that you're not going to be experimenting with during this lecture, but one that I think you may have an opportunity to experiment with in the future, because I hope this code will become publicly available in uh, the next few years. And that's a moving mesh code. So have people heard of moving mesh codes a little bit? So. Uh, I think the name sort of says it all. You, uh, you advect your, your mesh along with your flow. And so you get the Lagrangian aspects of an SPH code and all of the other uh, sort of hydro uh, capturing features of a code with a Riemann solver. Um, the disadvantages are there are a lot of complexities in addressing numerical diffusion and conservation because of the way that you're advecting your mesh. And I'll talk about this more in a second. Um, because you are recreating a mesh at basically every or frequently in time, you actually have a huge slowdown because you don't just get to choose one grid and keep it for the entire simulation. You have to keep changing it. Uh, it can also have complex boundary conditions and uh, somewhat similar to SPH where you have particle sampling noise, you actually get grid sampling noise. So if I have a Cartesian grid, I lay it down once, there's no errors associated with choosing that domain. If I keep laying down new grids, I actually build up errors uh, due to resampling and recreating a mesh at every time step. So the code I'll talk about in particular is um, a repo, uh, which is sort of, um, I guess you can think of a gadget version three or four. It's sort of the, uh, the new version of, that uh, Volker Springle has come up with. And Again, the idea is that you get to have the Lagrangian aspects of an SPH code. So this is a um, Keplerian accretion disk where at time zero, uh, this is an image from Diego Munoz, who's a graduate student just finishing up the CFA. He has marked in blue the location of cells at the very initial time. And then you see, as the disk evolves, these cells are now spread out. And they've moved as you would expect the flow to move. And so what that means is that, again, you are not facing this high Mach number problem. You're not advecting your flow rapidly across the mesh. The mesh is moving with your flow. And then you do a Riemann problem where you only have a little bit of flux going between cells. And these are just some example calculations he's done of actually uh, disks around binaries interacting. So this is a problem that involves both the lack of uh, access of symmetry and um, Keplerian disk, so it's, it's very well suited to this method. I'll just zoom in here. This is an example of a disk uh, with an embedded protoplanet. So there's the density structure. And now I think you can sort of see how, uh, in the same manner as SPH, the, the grid cells are automatically adapting to the local density. So you can see in the spiral wake here, you have a very high density of cells. And in this region of low density, the cells are getting bigger. So it's sort of automatically giving you the properties of AMR that you're putting your resolution where the action is. And so this is, this, 
this is sort of an easy way where you don't have to worry about the, uh, the boundary conditions between your levels because you aren't artificially imposing sort of a step up to the next level. Yeah? Yes. It's very, I mean, so you don't necessarily do it at every time step, but that, that's, that's, why, uh, that's why this is complex. So I'll just show you briefly how the mesh is constructed. Again, I should give credit to Diego Munoz. These are his slides. So uh, this is called a, yeah. It's a cylindrical mesh? Sorry? This probe is a cylindrical mesh? No. It is a Voronoi mesh. Uh, what about the third dimension? I think uh, this is this is 2D. But what happened in the, in the center of the mesh? Why, why there's no, no sides? There are no sides. Sorry, why are there no sides? Oh, this this is just a hole. There's just this is just the in the interior of the bound the grid is chosen to be here. So it is cylindrical in the sense that there is a circular hole in the middle. So but that's a boundary condition there in the center? So there's a boundary there. There's a boundary condition so here. The hole is a cell because there is no density there? The hole is not part of the computational domain. So just as in a Cartesian grid code, you have boundary conditions on the edges of the x and the y domain, or the z domain, you can, have a boundary, you can have a boundary condition in this direction as well. This is one of the things that's more complicated about a uh, sort of moving mesh code is that you're right that it's not obvious how you implement a smooth cylindrical or spherical boundary condition when you have um, cells that are changing size. So essentially what you have to do is you have to fix some, th some properties of the cells in the central region. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't have that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly, they are harder to, you, they're harder to implement than a, than a boundary condition in a non-moving mesh code. But you do have you do have a lot more flexibility. That's that's correct. So, so, but the geometry in direction is it Cartesian geometry or no? That's so. Let me let me show you. So, because you have a mesh that is moving with the flow, you can't define that all the cells are always square or always pie shaped. They can have an arbitrary shape, and so there are these mathematical techniques that you can use to construct what's called a Voronoi mesh, and that that means that your cells have a arbitrary number of sides. And they can change from one time step to the next. And so you construct it using what's called a uh, Delaunay triangulation. So the idea is if you take these, each of these triangles here in black, the Delaunay triangulation basically says if I want, I, have to, I can draw a circle that goes through all the points of my triangle, and then there's a single point that, that lies at the um, at the center, center of that circle. And the sort of rule when you're making a Delaunay triangulation is that if I draw a circle through my triangle, it can't intersect any of the other triangles in my domain. So if, I, if you imagine that I were to take this point and move it to the right, and then try to draw the circle that, sir, that uh, inscribed all of them, I couldn't just draw a single circle and I would start going into another one of my triangles. So I don't want to, I don't want to go into this in, in uh, too much gory detail, but basically there is a, uh, a nice topological way that you can generate a unique set of um, uh, mesh generating points um, sort of independent of the geometry. And so what I'm showing you right here is that now I've removed the circles and the mesh is now generated the Voronoi mesh is generated by connecting the, the, the dots that lied at the centers of the circles that intersected all of the points in the triangle. So this is the Voronoi mesh here, and you can see that it has, uh, that each of the cells has a different number of sides and that they're irregular. And so this is how the mesh is generated every time you regenerate it, and these center points are the way that you decide how the, how the flow is moving. So you advect the cells using that um, using those center points. And then you treat it just like you would any other grid code, and at each of these interfaces, you just solve a Riemann problem. And the way that most of the solver, most of the people using a repo do it is they actually use an exact Riemann solver instead of one of the approximate ones, but you can put an approximate one in um, if you want. The big difference 
compared to uh, most grid codes is that you solve the Riemann problem in the frame of the cell phrase. So as you're generating this mesh, you sort of automatically get out the motion of each of the faces from one time step to the next. So you know sort of what the velocity of the flow is at this point. And then when you solve the Riemann problem, you boost into that frame. And again, this reduces your truncation errors by naturally reducing the flux going between cells. You boost into the frame where everything, where as little as possible is moving, and so you have very little intercell communication. And so that means that you can more accurately calculate the fluxes in between the two cells. So you're getting a lot of the advantages of a grid code with the Lagrangian nature of an SPH code. So this is just a, a nice simulation of uh, showing when you're doing this sort of instability how the cells are moving with the flow. And the advantage you get is that you can resolve these curls with much lower resolution than if you had a fixed code or, or you know, sort of effectively fewer particles than if you were using an SPH code. So applying this to the problem of uh, binary formation, this is just a movie, uh, again, from Diego Munoz of two colliding protostellar disks in a binary system. And these objects, these stars are starting out marginally bound. And this is sort of a test case. This is sort of the best thing you could possibly imagine if you, what you want to do is make a close binary system with a circumbinary disk. You crash two disks directly into one another with retrograde orbits and velocities. But you can see what happens is that you form a nice circumbinary disk in a very, very tight binary. Um, this is not to say that this is the way that uh, these types of systems form, just sort of a demonstration of the power of using a code like this. So in the last couple minutes, I just want to briefly mention that there's another kind of n body that I don't think has been talked about. Um, and I just kind of want to ask whether or not this is something that people would like to hear about tomorrow. So you've talked about sort of very, very highly many body n body. But in star and planet formation, we're often concerned with systems that contain only a few bodies, say 3 or 5 or 10 or 2,000. And if you're trying to understand the interactions in a forming planetary system, we want a very um, accurate uh, calculation of the relative gravitational forces. And so we need to do direct integration of the equations of motion. Um, and there's sort of a couple of different ways that this is done, um, sort of run cutter methods, which are the most simple. Uh, for certain problems, um, symplectic methods such as wisdom Holman mapping are very simple. And then there's sort of the in-between, which are these adaptive time step methods like bohr stohr So are these things that people have heard of or would like to hear more about? Or do you want, people want to just keep it on hydro this week? OK, I'll let people maybe tell me afterwards, because I can throw this into the protostellar disk talk tomorrow. Um, but I just want to point out that you know, people often think that these that, you know, oh, this is a computational astrophysics workshop. Why should we worry about these few body problems? That's trivial, blah, blah, blah. Um, so many problems in planetary dynamics are what we call embarrassingly parallel, meaning that even though any given calculation can be carried out on a single processor, because all the processes involved are highly chaotic, you need to do many, many realizations. So it's very trivial to do the parallelization. You don't have to worry about all the things that Tom was talking about earlier today. Um, but you still have to worry about efficiency because you can easily get into a situation where you want to carry out um, many tens of thousands or even millions of different calculations. So I just want to put that out there. And I'm just going to skip over this slide and end with a quick advertisement. So starting in, in January, I'm going to be moving to the University of Arizona. And I just want to tell a room full of maybe some later stage graduate students who might be looking for postdocs that Arizona is not just a place for telescopes. They are rapidly building a dynamic theory group, including uh, me, Gertina Besla, who does galaxy formation and dynamics. But I'm sure she could be convinced to work on star and planet formation. She certainly did as an undergraduate. Um, Andrew Uden, who works on planetary and solar system formation. And then Travis Barman, who's actually joining LPL rather than the astronomy department. And he works on planetary atmospheres. He's more of a modeler, but still actually does a lot of computational work. So uh, 
If you are applying for postdocs this fall, please keep your eye out. We're going to be advertising a new theory fellowship. And if you're not finishing up this year, there will be another one next fall. So just keep that in mind. Um, but there's going to be, I think, a lot of uh, exciting work going on at Arizona in the, in the coming years. So it's not just for telescopes. And uh, yes, there is snow in Tucson. That's, those are the Catalina Mountains. So I'll just finish up there and let everybody go to lunch. Thanks. Thank you.